am I? Good morning. I'm Judith Lay, welcoming you to Praise, the programme that connects faith and daily life. Man's Radio. On this International Women's Day, it's quite appropriate that we should be hearing from two very different women linked by a common belief. And one of them will be talking about the single biggest organisation in the Anglican Church worldwide, which just happens to be made up of over four million women. But let's start with some music. A great morning hymn, Christ whose glory fills the skies, triumph or the shades of night. St. Michael singers from their CD Morning Gladness and Christ Whose Glory Fills the Skies. We're now in the season that the Church calls Lent, weeks of preparation for the great feast of Easter, a good time to spring clean our spiritual values. But as we reflect on our journey through life, we could easily find ourselves discouraged. We're told that God always walks with us, but questions about his acceptance of us may linger. Let's listen to Dylan's story and reflect together on this whole question of acceptance. Dylan has his own very personal experience, both of rejection and acceptance. I was raised by my mother who was an alcoholic and found it very difficult to to look after me in in the sort of day-to-day practical way that uh, children need looking after because she was, you know, she was drunk most of the time. And she went through three marriages, three divorces, three uh, violent husbands. And by the time I came to secondary school age, I was extremely angry, mixed up, confused. But at that point, I remember some friends of mine uh, inviting me along um, to a tent on a piece of ground in the town which turned out to be Mission England in 1984. I actually walked into into the tent to see people singing and clapping and playing guitars and it it hit me between the eyes. I'd never seen anything like it before Um, and it looked very, very attractive to me. People looked happy. I actually met some of these people and uh, they told me they were Christians. They explained to me that that God loved me, that Jesus loved me, that Jesus accepted me for who I am. All I had to ask was was Jesus to to come into my heart, as they described it, and ask Jesus to, to be a part of my life and he would accept me. Now that was an extremely attractive proposition, somebody who is offering acceptance to me without me having to sign a contract 
or without me having to satisfy certain criteria or conditions before that happened. So I went for it and, and I prayed with them and I started to go to church from that moment on. And I got right into the, the heart of the church, so much so in fact that I became really the, the, the life and soul of the church. I'd come from this extremely difficult and awful background. I had an awful lot going on and, and none of that was resolved. It was kind of brushed over in that now that I knew Jesus and had accepted Jesus and he had accepted me, that somehow all the, those problems that had been backed up for years would somehow just go away. And obviously they didn't, they hadn't. And they were still there, they'd just been suppressed for a while and were under the surface. When I was 18, I left to go to university. And just as I had dived in to church and gone for that in a big way, I, I dived into to that as well. Because this was really the first time that I'd been away from all the bad memories and all the, the, the places that I associated with my past and the people that I associated with the past. And I think it was time for me to start to, to discover who I really was and I remember going to the Christian Union and and feeling that these people didn't understand me they seemed to be almost like the people that I'd met before in the church shiny on the on the surface and so long as you could come out with the right jargon and say the right words at the right time then that was fine uh, but I didn't feel any sense of identity with these people. I could identify, I felt, with people outside of the Christian Union who seemed to be more real, more accepting of different kinds of, of people with different experiences. So I was attracted away from the Christian scene. We may have shared Dylan's experiences, or we may have been reminded of other similar experiences, some painful. We offer all of these to God as we listen for his word through scripture. Then Jesus and his disciples went away to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, tell me, who do people say I am? Some say that you are John the Baptist, they answered. Others, that you are Elijah, while others say that you are one of the prophets. What about you? he asked them. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Part of my looking for God again has been to read and one book was uh, called Dancing on the Edge which is written by Richard Holloway and he's written that book really for people who describe themselves as being on the edge or on the fringes of faith or of the church and I think that's you know where I would have to say that I am. One thing in the book which really struck me quite profoundly was the story of the, the prodigal son which Jesus tells in the Bible of the man who has two sons and one goes to him one day and says, I want my share of, of the inheritance before you die. I don't want to wait that long. And he takes that money off and he goes and, and spends it on prostitutes and having parties and wild living, as, as it says. And then his money runs out and his friends desert him and he finds himself working with the pigs. And he thinks to himself, even the servants that work for my dad back at home have a better life than this. I'm going to go back there and ask to be a servant. And at that point, uh, Richard Holloway points out that the son is not being remorseful, he's not feeling guilty about what he's done. He's trying to scheme his way back uh, into his dad's house because that's where he had the cushy life. And his father is actually waiting and looking as he has been, been doing every day for his son to come back. This man is now running out to meet his son and to accept him back. And that helped me to, to realise and to see God as accepting me, but his acceptance of me precedes any approach that I make to him, whether that approach is done out of a sense of sorrow or guilt or anything like that, whatever it's from, his 
acceptance of me is there before I even do that. And I can relax in that and move on. And so we pray. If you come in certainty or in confusion, in anger or in anguish, this time is for us. If you come in silent suffering or hidden sorrow, in pain or promise, this time is for us. If you come and do not know why, to be here is enough. This time is for us. Come now, Christ of the forgiving warmth. Come now, Christ of the yearning tears. Come now, Christ of the transforming touch. This time is for you. Thou art the peace of all things come. Thou art the place to hide from harm. Thou art the light that shines in the dark. Thou art the heart's eternal spark. Thou art the door that's open wide. Thou art the guest who waits inside. Thou art the strength. Thou art the calling of the poor. Thank you to our friends at GRF Christian Broadcasting for sharing Dylan's story. And the music was from Came, Heather Innes and Jacinth Hamill. The Mother's Union, the biggest single organisation within the Anglican Church, with four and a half million members worldwide, has made history by appointing the Right Reverend Dr Emma Einson, Bishop of Penrith, as their new central chaplain, the first time that the role has been filled by a woman. Bishop Emma will guide the spiritual lives of Mother's Union members throughout the UK. She was born in Birmingham, brought up in Kenya, where her parents worked in education, and spent her teenage years in South Wales. Emma met her husband Matt when they were at university, and they both went on to train for priestly ordination together at Trinity College. Since then, Emma's ministry has taken her into many different areas, from parish leadership to retreat work, college lecturing, general synod membership, and just six years ago, she returned to the very college where she and Matt had trained, but this time she went back to be its principal. She's been involved in several important steering groups, including one relating to this summer's Lambeth Conference, and four years ago she became an honorary chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen. She's a woman of great ability with a real passion for the work of Mother's Union, as is obvious as she talks about her new appointment. Well, I, I was absolutely delighted to be asked to take on the role of central chaplain. You probably know that all bishops, uh, as well as their responsibilities within the diocese, take on wider roles as well. And there were several reasons why the Mother's Union uh, just seemed to fit with my passions and the things I'm interested in. I love the emphasis on supporting the family. Um, my own family life has been hugely significant for me. I'm married to a clergyman, we have two adult children, and I think alongside my faith in Christ, uh, my life in my family um, has been one of the most formative things for me. So being able to encourage and support the work Mother's Union does in supporting family life uh, is really exciting and a real privilege. Now more than ever, the family needs supporting and encouraging. Family life is under great pressure 
pressure in lots of different ways. Um, it's very different, it's changing, the shape of families are changing all around the world. Uh, financial pre pressures, uh, poverty can all put many demands on the life of the family. And so I think releasing families to be that place of encouragement and joy and support uh, is something I really believe in and I know the Mothers' Union does too. And so I'll be really happy to help out in any way that I can. Uh, I have known about Mothers' Union for many, many years. My own grandmother was a firm and uh, very committed member of her local Mothers' Union for her whole life and she died several years ago and uh, I know that her local branch uh, was a support and a place of real encouragement of fellowship of community for her um, so I've known about it through her uh, when I was a curate my husband and I both joined Mother's Union at the same time alongside our vicar um, we all three of us decided that we all wanted to join at the same time so Mother's Union has been been part of my life for a very long time. I love that Mothers Union, although it does support mothers and it is for women, it's not only for mothers and for women and is open to, to men, uh, is a well and truly inclusive organisation in that way. Matt and I have always been um, slightly uh, into challenging gender roles in different ways and so we were delighted to both join as a couple and I love the fact that men can be me members of Mothers Union alongside women. I am so excited that Mothers Union is such a worldwide organisation, being in 84 different countries around the world with 4 million members, the capacity of an organisation like that to influence real change on the ground is huge. Uh, I love the fact that our worldwide president is from Guyana and um, that's a wonderful thing that she will bring to the organisation. I think we live in a world where fragmentation and misunderstandings can so easily develop between people and communities so the mother's union presents something different which is an opportunity to learn from each other to, um, to understand each other despite all of our differences to share together um, and to find out about lives that are different from our own I love, for instance, what I hear about the Mothers' Union's work in South Sudan, developing literacy and uh, financial training, and just hearing about the influence that that is having on the ground for women and for their families and the communities that they're part of. Um, closer to home in Carlisle Diocese, our members have been involved with uh, producing back-to-school bags for children starting school and the mothers and fathers dropping them off at the school gate and I very clearly remember that day uh, with both of my children. It's both a joy and a difficult day as you wave your children off to school. So that's a wonderful ministry that our members here are involved with. They've also been looking at issues of loneliness. That can be a real problem in rural communities and seeing what they can do to support people in that way. So there are some amazing stories of what members are doing around the world. I would consider it a real privilege to be able to pray for Mother's Union. I think um, the work of the Mother's Union in supporting Christian faith is so exciting and uh, anything I can do as central chaplain to encourage that, to pray, to meet members, to meet the different committees, to hear about what's going on around the country um, and to play my part in that. I think there is, as in the church generally, particularly in this country, the challenge to show the, the relevance of the Mother's Union to, particularly to a younger generation. A lot of Mother's Union members are older and that is wonderful. We need grandmothers, we need spiritual grandmothers, we need actual grandmothers um, to be the wisdom in their communities and to share what they've learned over a long life. So I love our older members. It would also be great to look at what we can do to encourage a younger membership and to show people that actually the things that Mother's Union is concerned about to do with um, justice, poverty, releasing people into being who they're meant to be, these are issues that are, are of great concern to younger women as well. So anything I can do to, to sort of broaden awareness of Mother's Union and to open the demographic more widely, I'd be very happy to do that. All the time praying.
I'm very keen to think about strengthening relationships with clergy since I'm married to a clergyman myself. <laughs> so uh, this is very dear to my heart. I think it's really important that the Mother's Union sees itself as part of the local church and not separate from it. Um, it's really important that Mother's Union members and clergy stay in close contact with each other and find ways of communicating well about the issues um, that are affecting the churches and the communities that they're both part of. And that's the point, isn't it? We're both on the, we're all on the same team. We're all part of God's church. We are all wanting to build the kingdom in the places where we are. So there are some great examples of Mother's Union branches and clergy working really well together. So let's learn from where it's going well. Thou art my Lord, and with me still. Thou art my love, keep me from ill. Thou art the light, the truth, the way. Thou art my Saviour, A little more music from Came, and before that, the Right Reverend Dr Emma Einson, Bishop of Penrith, was sharing her views on the work of Mother's Union, supporting family life in all its forms. In her role as central chaplain, Bishop Emma will guide the spiritual life of Mother's Union members throughout the UK. And so to my final guest today, American Angela Dudley, talking to me some while ago when she visited the island. Angela and her husband David are co-founders of One Body in Christ Ministries, which they operate from their big ranch in Lynchburg, Virginia, in the United States. They also have five children, are foster parents, and David is a professional fisherman too. So clearly the last thing that Angela needed was another job. But, as you're about to hear, no matter how busy you are, some experiences simply can't be ignored. Let's join Angela now as she describes her upbringing in a Roman Catholic family. Both my parents were very strong in their faith. They had eight children, and all of us grew up in the church and just very active. Jesus was really celebrated. We, My parents were part of the Curcio movement in the Catholic Church, and so our faith wasn't about just doing things for God. It was really about celebrating Him. And so as I grew up, the questions came, of course. You know, why do I want to still believe this, and is it real? And so I had to go to God. And over the years, He's proved Himself to me again and again and again. So He always really works in my heart, so it's not just about what I want, but part of my heart that comes alive, I know that he's working there. And in meeting your husband, did you feel that God led you somewhere the two of you were going to meet? Yes, absolutely. When I met him, we were just friends for about six months. I really wasn't that interested until he started talking about his faith and wanting to build a church and what his plans all were. And he was a professional bass fisherman and he has this huge career. And to him, that was just a side thing. Really, he did all of that just so that he could build this church that God put on his heart. And when I saw that his faith was everything to him, I knew he's the one for me. So you got married and what did you do? Did you build a church? Well, we're in the process still. It's extremely expensive. So we moved to Virginia and got the land. And then we bought another piece of land where we're going to put the building right right next to it. And so we're kind of cleared land. It's been 12 years, I don't know, for him, 22 years of saving and working and trusting. And so far we have about 180 acres and a big cleared spot of land and we're waiting to build. But we do lots of ministry on the farm already. Now, you have started this One Body in Christ Ministries, and that's based on the ranch that you live on now. Yes, we have on this part of the property, the healing side and the other side's the worship side because we're going to build a worship building over there. It's not really a Sunday church. It's really just a place to be open for all churches to come together and worship God. So what we do on the other side of the farm right now, we have baseball fields and football fields and soccer and lacrosse and cross country and horseback riding and fishing and hiking and all kinds of things. And all of it's open for people to use. Any church groups and community groups use it for free and they can come out and put on whatever they want. And we put on kids camps and clubs and all kinds of things, women's Bible studies and retreats. And Is it very well used? Yes, constantly. There's people in and out every day. The church groups all come and we've got a church just approached us wanting to start their Spanish church at the farm. We have a 
a place where there's a bunch of pews out by, by the pond. It's kind of an open, pretty spot. So it's open for camps, for clubs, anything they want to do. You know, if we're faithful, he'll be faithful. Now, God has put something else on your heart, and this is what has brought you to the Isle of Man, the first in a series of three books that you have just written. Setting out to be an author was not something that you were intending to do, really, were you? No. Uh, When you run a ministry and you have five kids, a lot of them were very little at the time, and we did foster care, so we had extra kids. And we have Dave's full-time Christian career and... No, I was driving to see family in Pittsburgh. Strangely enough, I was alone in the car and I drove about a seven hour drive. And I don't know how to explain it other than I had a vision. Like I was like I wasn't even in the car. I was sitting in a movie theater watching a movie and it was an extraordinary story. I loved it, but it was just in my head. I couldn't share it with anybody. So, you know, I pray, prayed about it. What do you want me to do with this? And I really felt he was telling me it's supposed to be a movie. And so I had to write the books. So that was the first step. So I spent about eight years doing research, you know, in, in between kids and, you know, between midnight and 1 a.m. when everybody was asleep. What you saw in this vision was something set in the 1500s, not a period that you knew a great deal about. So you had to research all of that. And you had to decide where you were going to set it, didn't you? Every book has to be set somewhere. And you had an idea of the place. You sketched out what the place would be like. I couldn't find anywhere that it would match. And I was ready to give up. I finally just drew a picture of of a land. And I thought, well, here's the country. We're just going to have to make this up. But there was real people like Martin Luther and Bishop Fisher and Thomas More. And I thought, I could just drop them in Narnia. You know, I have to have a real place. So I went back and forth, back and forth. Finally, I found this little island in the Irish Sea. And I said, what is this? And I zoomed in and the map matched the map I drew. The mountains were the trees, everything, like everything matched. The, there was a priory and there was the nunnery. I mean, all of these things matched exactly. So it must have been an extraordinary feeling when you realised that the Isle of Man, this little island that you'd never heard of, corresponded exactly to what you needed for this story. Absolutely. It's almost like having a big puzzle and you have pieces all over the place and then you look and there's that this piece fits and then that piece fits and then that piece fits. We know that it's set in the 15th hundreds. The book is called The Feather and it's the first in a trilogy of books. Just give us an idea of the story, Angela. Okay. The trilogy is called Ravencrest and it's about a secret fellowship of believers at that time. The Feather is the first book in the series and it begins the story of Nicholas, uh, Tudor's son, and Arabella, a princess in the Isle of Man, obviously fictional. And it follows their early life. It's the beginning, the creation of the setting of all of it is the first book. And the feather really is very symbolic of someone who lays their life down for what they believe in. That means that much to them. And so the feather, the first in the Ravencrest trilogy, set in a place its author had never even heard of, was published privately, not promoted commercially, but just left at Angela Dudley's own request to simply be discovered. And it would seem that this week The Feather is taking yet another direction, becoming an audiobook read by none other than the wonderful John Rhys Davis and produced here on the island. And where might that lead? It's a story we'll follow with interest. Angela Dudley has a deep personal faith, not something that everyone shares. I wondered why she thinks that might be. Sometimes we're like little kids who just want to eat a whole bag full of lollipops. And when he says no, or he doesn't work with our plans, we get frustrated and angry. And I feel like that's how a lot of the world is towards God. And we think he's not for us, but he's always for us. Sometimes he's not for the things we're for, but he's always for us. And so if we can trust him more than just wanting him to fix our life and make it what we want, then we could see that. we have. But we have to learn to trust him first and then we'll realize that he's after good things. And that's all we have time for today. Thank you for listening to this week's Praise Podcast. There's a new Praise Podcast available every Sunday morning. You can subscribe for free at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify via the Manx Radio smartphone app or at manxradio.com. So, till we meet again, this is Judith saying thank you for your company and I wish you and those you love every blessing in the days ahead. Music.